I am very burnt out right now. I worked a 12 hour day today, so I didn't get to talk to you guys much because I was just anxious and stressed and it's just hard right now. Just a lot of dread about work this week. There's just so much I want to do and work is preventing me from doing it. But it took me a long time to convince myself that it just wasn't gonna work. And I think everybody, that's the hard part about being on YouTube, like everybody was just like, you need to get out of this job, it's not for you. Like this, why the fuck are you still in this job? Like it doesn't match your ethics, it doesn't match your politics. Like you don't like it, why the fuck are you in it? And I didn't really have a good reason for it. It was just like safe. If there's anything my audience has been wanting from me, it's number one to be gay and number two to quit my job. And I'm delivering on one of those today. Happy Pride Month and I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all have been waiting for this almost as long as we've been waiting for Sky Freyer to drop new music. And you know what? She dropped a new single and boom, I'm unemployed. So more than ever, especially as I've been interacting with a lot of you on Patreon in a much more like intimate one-on-one -on -one way through book club and through live streams, like it's become so apparent to me that the algorithm has used my channel as a conduit to connect all of these burnout, left-leaning, recovering overachievers. And I do see myself as an ambassador of the movement. As a representative, it's time to update you with the State of the Union, the latest plans. This is not a video that's going to convince you that quitting your job is going to be the salvation of the universe and our liberation. It is just a video where I delicately balance expressing what I've been up to without needing you to agree or approve. If you just listened to that preamble and got nothing from it, you would get a lot more from it next time if you joined your like-minded peers in subscribing. If you don't, I can imagine YouTube will probably serve at least a couple more of my videos in your recommended or homepage. So might as well get ahead of it, not to invoke your proactive, high-performing tendencies, but getting ahead of it may be a good idea. There's my best pitch. That's my, I'm leaving sales, there was my best pitch. Okay. And now in order to inhabit the correct narrative headspace, I come to you from the ground, which is of course where any good crisis first takes root. Um, so I was myopically happy in my career for at least a few years, like the first three years. I say myopically because I didn't allow myself to challenge the feelings of discontentment or dissonance that did bubble up in the first stages of my career. I would only allow myself to accept feelings that allowed me to just pedal forward, which makes sense, right? That's self-preservation. My first inclination to quit didn't really come until two years ago, conveniently the summer of 2020 when many crises were afoot. But starting in January of that year, I was traveling every week for work in a role that wasn't meant to be traveling. It was supposed to be more of a desk job that supported the salespeople that would travel. So what that meant for me is that I was out on the road three to four days a week, which was the highlight of the job for me and not having that component of the job definitely impacted my satisfaction during the early pandemic. But anywho, I would be gone three to four days a week and come back to my desk and needing to do what was then five days of work in like one to two days at my actual computer. With the amount of work I was taking on at that stage of my career, that was not possible for me. And I was never able to play catch up on what I was behind on, which just exasperated me. Like I started working later and later and then March hit, we went into lockdown and I thought that would allow me to catch up and regain my footing. But instead I became omni available to my coworkers, to the company, and I would work until midnight or 11 p.m. some days. There's tons of documentation of that phase of my job. So if you want more detail, I will do my best to link the vlogs below that capture it. But during the summer of 2020, I was sitting on eight months of compounded overwork, which hurt me in more ways than one and really was the initial catalyst for this decision. That's why I'm talking about it at all. In this same timeline, my feelings towards my job were also really colored by the freshly diagnosed chronic illness that I was coming to terms with over the course of 2020. And for the first time, I was bumping up against the ableism that so many 
chronically ill and disabled people experience under a capitalist model of work where your humanity really takes a backseat to your ability to produce. I feel in myself a desire to go more deeply into that part of the story, but I'm going to let past Kath speak on it because I do already have a dedicated video about that piece of my experience. And I do want to get through the rest of this decision. So there's the overwork building up. There's the ableism creeping in. And then there's the cognitive dissonance of my personal ethics and the contradictions to those ethics I faced at work. I was watching my company make public statements in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, but then internally having me as a salesperson sell to what I can only term as prison labor companies. And I'm not talking about like Walmart using prison labor to make their goods. I'm talking about a company whose business model is literally selling prison labor to other companies that my company not only had as a customer, but was a customer of. So we were buying incarcerated women's outbound marketing labor for pennies on the dollar instead of paying people a living wage. And like, it's not like the company I was working for would sell to anyone either. They had standards. They wouldn't sell to a porn hub or an OnlyFans. So sex work is abominable in their boardroom, but prison labor, grabagun.com, a company whose aim is to make firearms as accessible as possible, no issues there. And um, did I send an email about it? Yeah. Did anything come of it? Of course not. Beyond that, I had witnessed, experienced, been the observer of so much misogyny, so much racism, so much bigotry directly from colleagues that just really weighed on me and my faith in humanity, period, as well as direct mistreatment and harassment. Not only was my harassment not taken seriously, but I was not protected from my harasser and was forced to travel with him, work directly with him over the course of the last six months of my career. And it goes without saying that that really deeply troubled me. So... By the end of 2020, um, I had hit a wall and my therapist at the time told me straight up, like, you need to quit your job. You need to quit your job. Like, that's what you need to do. You need to quit your job. And I didn't want to hear it. Like, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to have to come to terms with that. That was too big of a change for me to make in that moment when I was already feeling so weak and so dilapidated and tired and just dead inside. Like, I wasn't ready. And so I sought out every other avenue to get me back to where I needed to be that wasn't as drastic as permanently quitting my job, including considering a medical leave of absence, which I wish I had taken, but honestly didn't think that I qualified for. Not like legally, but personally, I didn't want to let myself believe that like I was in that bad of a state. Like I didn't want to accept that the moment I was in was as bad as it was. So I basically committed myself to resolving as much of my mood as possible through group therapy. I started doing DBT to help with my anxiety and depression. I started working with my therapist to set more boundaries at work so that I wasn't taking on as much. I started using weed to just numb out after work so that I wouldn't have to process or deal with any of these emotions. I started taking classes on understanding capitalism and then organizing with that political project. I dove into my hobbies and started embroidering and writing poetry and just diversifying my fulfillment focal point away from my job as much as possible. Eventually, I ditched getting high alone in my bedroom for antidepressants, which was a really good move. Thank you, Wellbutrin, for doing God's work. And eventually, when it was safe to do so, I just started manically seeing all of my friends, filling my life back up with extroversion, which honestly like was a huge contributor to my depression. And then at some point, I was like, okay, maybe it's living at home with my parents that needs to change. And I got up and packed up and moved to my dream city of Seattle and thought maybe that would make me feel whole again. Newsflash, there's still like 20 minutes left in the video. So needless to say, that did not work. I've like fixed everything in my life but this job and now the buck stops here. What came next was my quiet quitting era, which this phase wasn't intentional as much as it was just something I sort of like slid into. For those of you that don't know what quiet quitting is, there's another creator who has done a great job of explaining it. Quiet quitting is you come to work maybe like a minute 
before you got to clock in. You do just enough to not get in trouble. You leave at exactly five o'clock and you basically do just enough to get by and not get fired. Basically, it's like your body is physically at the job. You're physically coming, clocking in and doing your job, but you're mentally checked out. I didn't even realize there was a term for what I was doing until a friend sent me a TikTok about quiet quitting. And then I became aware that I was actually in an invisible community of fellow people withholding their labor value from their employers. This was something you didn't see much of on my YouTube channel. I don't think you'll see many people open up about quiet quitting, but believe it or not, there are quite a few people doing it. This was one story of someone who quiet quit featured in an article Business Insider did on the phenomenon. Every week, Justin pushed the boundaries ever so slightly, logging on half an hour later, logging off half an hour earlier, taking long lunches, running errands in the middle of the day. He struggled as he tried to shed his old work ethic, admonishing himself as lazy, wondering whether he was a burned out failure. His colleagues asked why he was no longer returning their late night emails until the next morning. For a guy who had always gone above and beyond, it was uncomfortable doing the bare minimum. I was sweating bullets, but I was like, look, they're not going to fire me, he said. It would take them months to find someone new and train them up. My lessened productivity is better than zero productivity. I don't really know how much detail anybody wants on this, but like essentially... I would jump on the calls I had to get on, I would respond to the emails I had to, but I was not spending hours preparing for anything anymore. I was not making my PowerPoints look polished. I was not rehearsing for presentations. I was just showing up, like literally bare minimum, just showing up where I had to show up and not taking anything too seriously. I was no longer leaving my computer in a logged in state so that Slack would show me online. I was not hunting for new deals to close. I was letting my work fit around my lifestyle instead of letting my lifestyle revolve around my work. So if I did not have a call until 11 a.m. that day, I did not log on until 11 a.m. I had a nice slow morning because work emergencies do not exist in tech sales. In reality, emails can sit in your inbox for longer than 40 minutes. You do not have to respond to things so quickly. I trusted that if something were seriously wrong and actually urgent, instead of just the capitalist, white supremacist notion of urgent, like someone would give me a call about it. And I did try to quite quit ethically where like I wasn't making other people's lives harder. I just was minimizing the amount of like space I took up at work truly. And thus began my little labor experiment of actually seeing how much of what I used to be doing was superfluous. And the results may not surprise you, but they did horrify me because there was effectively no difference. Like I suffered no repercussions, which I know might piss some people off to hear because it pissed me off to experience because I had spent three years busting my fucking ass and then suddenly I was doing nothing. And like the only difference was like me not getting as much praise. I soon realized that the results of going above and beyond were only fractionally better than the rock bottom bare minimum. I was now doing. Like my work ethic really was being taken advantage of. I still ended up getting a raise. It wasn't a merit-based raise, but like they still deemed my work good enough to like pay me more money in all of that. And I know that's infuriating because all of my efforts for three years then were quantifiably useless. And I said no to vacations and said no to plans that I never needed to because my work wasn't as valuable as I thought it was. This labor experiment works so well because we're in a moment when hiring and training new talent is so expensive and so difficult that most companies just want to retain whoever they have because it's more effective and cheaper, even if those aren't like A plus laborers. And second of all, because I work in an industry where if I do nothing, no one gets hurt. Like, if I don't close a deal for a SaaS web asset management platform, one of 17 other competitors will fill that void for me. Like, the world will keep turning. And that's the thing about capitalism. The free market helps its cause as much as it hurts it because there's so much redundancy. Like, if my company didn't exist, there are six others that do the exact same thing that can take its place. It's not like I'm letting anybody down in the grand scheme of things. Um, let it be known that quiet quitting wasn't a long-term strategy for me. And I don't think it is for most people because quite honestly, it doesn't sit well. It's not good on your psyche. And it didn't heal the dread that I so desperately needed 
gone from my life. So it didn't accomplish what I ultimately needed. But again, I didn't go into it thinking this was going to be the silver bullet. It just sort of happened to me. And then once I was in it, it was really hard to get out of it because how do you motivate yourself to work harder when you know that the level you're at right now is sustainable? Sometimes a yucky feeling is reasoning enough. So at this point, the buck had to stop somewhere. I wasn't ready to quite pinpoint where and when, though. I let the timeline to quit slip and slip and slip in favor of the conservative choice, which is just to let life happen to you, you know? At first, I was like, okay, I'm going to quit at the end of the year. That's the most natural time. After the fourth quarter is over, I will exit stage left. That came and went because I got put on a new team with new coworkers and a new manager. And I was like, oh, wait, I'll just stay for this. Like, yeah. And then I was like, okay, the circumstances have changed slightly, but I know what I need to do. I need to quit. Then miraculously, like I talked about in the last section, I got a raise and I was like, oh, how could I leave now? Only an idiot would leave after they got a raise. That would be so stupid, right? So I stayed because I was like, this would just be humiliating to leave after I got a raise. And then I was like, okay, my sabbatical is coming up. Company paid sabbatical. That's such a privilege and a luxury. I should stay for that. So that means I need to stay until September. But then the end of the year is just a three months later. So the logic and the math were mathing. But I knew if I just kept following that same trajectory, I would literally never quit. Like there's always going to be something. And that is the realization I came to. So despite the raise, despite the new team, Despite the sabbatical I would be giving up, I made the decision in the spring to quit. But in order to do so, I knew that what you're supposed to do when you're in a job that you hate is apply, interview, and secure a job that you may like, or at least a marginally or substantially better job, and move right along into that one. So I did, and I put my name in the hats of a few nonprofits, and a couple didn't work out. A couple I moved down the path of the interview process with, and I actually did get to the offer phase with one. Seemingly, it was the obvious choice, Um, but something just felt off in my heart. I had a sense and I knew that I wanted to take time off for myself after this job. Like I wanted to spend time unemployed. I really, really wrestled with this decision because I couldn't let myself do what I wanted, even though I had saved up and prepared for that. This whole time, I was hoping that my company would see me quiet quitting and just fire me so that I wouldn't have to make the decision myself. And then when I was applying to jobs, I was hoping they'd all reject me so that I could just take it as a sign that I need to take some time off so that I could quit in good conscience knowing that I had no other option. I had really expected the universe to decide for me, but instead the universe was like, it's on you, bitch. For once in your life, you need to truly be a free thinker and decide for yourself what's the best path forward for you. Not for your mom and your dad, not for your friends, not for your subscribers. Like what is best for you in the position you're in right now, knowing what you know that most people don't. Like I was the only one that could make that decision. And it was a real come to Jesus moment to reckon with my own fear-based thinking. Like I took my job out of college five years ago out of fear, out of a scarcity mindset of like, I don't know who's going to hire me the first job offer I get in the safest career choice possible. I'm just going to take that and chug forward because it's known and comfortable, even more so than the actual task of choosing between quitting and this job. I was reckoning with defeating my people pleasing nature and my eternal quest for external validation that you've all been a part of over the years. I'm always looking to impress and get people to confirm that I'm doing what's right. And importantly, this was one decision where not many people were going to validate me, but it was so pivotal for me in my Enneagram 3 character arc to do something a little out of bounds and a little unsafe. It seemed so much easier to take the job out of fear than to choose my own path, my own sabbatical, my own time off out of faith in myself and belief in my future. And even though I knew no one was going to give me the answer I needed to hear on this, I still went to everyone I could conceivably think of to try and get the answer that I needed. But I had the answer I needed. I just didn't want to accept it. It took me a long time to admit the truth of what needed to happen and what needed to go down here because 
I was so worried about what other people would think and what you would think, which is a horrible way to lead your life. To turn down a job offer I knew would provoke some people to think of me as entitled, and I had to make peace with that. At the same time, though, I don't think we should be doing capitalism's job for us and policing people into working if they have the ability not to for a little bit. There's just so much virtue trapped in working. It felt like choosing to be unemployed would make me a bad person. I owe it to myself to finally show up for my own needs and wants and stop attuning myself to the most esteemed, virtuous thing you could be. So finally, after many conversations with myself and my therapist and others, I ultimately asked the job if they would consider postponing my offer until the fall so I could take the time off that I felt I needed. And it's a maybe. So (laughs) I advocated for myself and I put my two weeks in at work, which you will see in my next Oversharing in Seattle video. And finally stopped waffling and went full fucking pancake. My patrons know where that's from. Ultimately, there's nothing radical about quitting your job without another one backed up. I'm not pretending that I am um, a revolutionary. The more based thing to do is to organize your workplace and form a union like so many workers are doing around the country right now at Starbucks and Verizon and REI. In some way, quitting a job is the coward's way out. For me, it was brave considering my path up until this point. I want to have the time to like really reflect before I move into this next direction um, and just funnel down another road because I don't want to do the same thing I did with sales with just accepting the easiest thing that came along and then just losing myself in the process. So finally, finally, what now? What's the plan? Well, I am going to be taking a self-funded sabbatical It is going to be primarily a break for my own well-being, which means that I am not going to try to spin YouTube into a full-time self-employed job. The wages I make from YouTube are not livable, but the income still will be very helpful throughout my unemployment. So thank you to my patrons. Thank you for those of you that tune in with your ad blocker off during the videos. Um, Timeline-wise, I'm at least going to stay underemployed or minorly self-employed or on sabbatical until October, at which point I will reevaluate and not rush into my next job without some, some deep critical thought. I know that the direction I could see myself heading in right now might be vastly different than the direction I could see myself heading in in five months. Like we've all seen everything everywhere all at once. We know that there are limitless pathways for our lives to take. I want to open myself up to possibilities I might not even see in front of me right now. But that gives me my first summer in Seattle to truly plug into this community, get more politically active here, which is a goal I've had for a while. I have lined myself up with a lot of opportunities to spend quality time with friends this summer. I have family visiting. I'll be exploring new hobbies and moving into some creative projects I've had in mind for a while. I will be fighting for my life not to let my overachieving nature take over and consume every waking hour of free time with some sort of activity or accomplishment. Ultimately, I want to use this time to slow down and reset. If you've been watching me for long enough, you may have seen me grapple with a few different chronic illnesses that have cropped up in my life. It seems as though I'm getting a new diagnosis every six to 12 months. And while it's not on my mind every day, there is a layer of me that understands that my ability level is is slowly degrading. Like I still have a very, very great quality of life. But I don't want to wait until retirement to take time for myself. And luxury to me, like true luxury to me would be to, well, like ultimately not work at all. But like true luxury at this state would be a period of retirement every three to four years. Like the ability to take your summers off, the ability to take time off intermittently instead of punching in your time card for 40 years. Like I would rather front load my retirement and make less money now than accumulate as much wealth as possible to take the end of my life off. Um, Especially because we don't know what the state of the world's gonna look like. Like truly, these are millennial thoughts. Climate anxiety considered, like this is the time in my life where I want to have complete control and autonomy. It has been so freeing that nobody owns my time. That has not been my reality for five years. For most of us, it's not our reality. And 
it's a rarity that I'm able to take. And I've had so many friends be unemployed over the last two years via their own volition or because of layoffs. And truly every single one of them says it's the best time of their life and they would go back to it in a heartbeat if they can. And I just want to experience that. Is that so wrong? To really affirm myself before I send this one out, what's irresponsible to others may be responsible for me. There you have it. To those of you on Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon that got this news first and have already reached out with words of support, thank you. Like (laughs) After this whole manifesto about how I no longer can rely on external validation, I still cannot deny that it does not feel good. Um, This was a personal triumph for me, but I hope that it will lead to some collective triumphs, whatever those may be as we work through our own capitalist conditioning and resulting scarcity mindsets and fear-based thinking. Thank you all for watching. I will see you all next time and Cather out. Yeah, it's just a big, it's just a big deal for me because I think I've done the very sensible, like predictable thing and stayed in my lane and what would impress my parents and what my peers would think is good all my life. And now I'm doing something that's just like, why the fuck would she do that? Honestly, I have the faith that I know I will be fucking fine. I know I will be fine. I have the faith. I have the, like, I truly have the privilege. Like, I know I will be fine. Okay, let's go voice memo therapy. Let's go voice memo therapy.